the realm of horror, there is a long-observed dichotomy between the East and the West. The general perception is that Eastern horror is more psychological, based around tension and mood, while Western horror focuses more on shock factor through the use of blood and jump scares. But does this dichotomy actually exist? Well, if there was a time that it existed, that time is long since past, at least for the Western world. In the golden age of media, there is a wide variety of Western horror that placates our varying palettes. That said, I've noticed that there are still those that believe in this dichotomy, that there is a fundamental difference in the psyche of the Western and Eastern horror consumer. As of late, I've increasingly borne witness to this attitude, and it has to do with the potential resurgence of a little Japanese horror franchise called Silent Hill. In case you're new to my channel, I will inform you that my presence on YouTube is heavily identified with my Silent Hill analysis. This is relevant to the current discussion because there have been whispers of multiple new Silent Hill games in the works. And most importantly, the whispers suggest that these games are being primarily made by Western developers. This has a lot of Silent Hill fans worried, because we saw what happened when Western developers got a hold of this license before. The general consensus is that they did a poor job capturing the horror or the spirit of the games made by the original developers. There are many reasons why those games aren't as well regarded, but one of the primary reasons, according to some, is that difference between West and East. Now because of my videos on Silent Hill, people naturally wanted to hear my opinion on whether or not these new games would turn out well. I have a more sophisticated perspective on that, which I will save for a later date. In regards to whether or not a Western developer could do a good Silent Hill game, I'm going to take the unpopular position. I think they can. We've already seen great Western games in the vein of Silent Hill. Soma had some Silent Hill-esque features. Visage, Cry of Fear. Hell, I know a lot of people don't like Bloober Team's games, and I don't like a lot of them either, but I will defend their game Observer to my dying day. That game was a brilliant merging of the Silent Hill ethos with science fiction. But those games are more in the vein of the Silent Hill's PT demo that came out in 2014. What about the original trilogy? Are there any Western horror games that come close to what the original Silent Hill trilogy did? Admittedly, there are barely any, but there is one that I think manages to synthesize both West and East, paying homage to the greats while also forging its own identity. That game is The Suffering. This game should not work. It tries to blend the kinetic third-person action of a Max Payne with the psychological horror of a Silent Hill. Admittedly, there are moments in this game where those opposing tones negate any potential for horror or excitement. But then there are moments where this alchemical mixture unifies these opposites in glorious harmony. In these moments, the action and the horror become so intense that you feel indistinguishable from the madness that is swallowing you. For these reasons and more, I wanted to do a retrospective on the game. I wanted to explain to my fellow Silent Hill fans how and why this game would satiate them while they wait for new games. I also wanted to demonstrate to longtime fans how and why this game possesses a greater deal of psychological depth and symbolism than they might have remembered. And what better time to do this than during the scariest month of the year? So grab your handguns and happy pills, we're kicking off the Spooktober celebrations by taking a look back at the suffering. If you thought HBO's Oz was the most hellish depiction of prison or hell, I would like to invite you to Abbott State Penitentiary, a fictional prison located on the fictional island of Carnate off the coast of the non-fictional US state of Maryland. You play as Torque, a man who was recently transferred to Abbott. He is on death row for the murder of his wife and two sons. Specifically, he is accused of beating his wife to a pulp, drowning one son and then throwing the other out of a window. He adamantly denies having done so, even though he was present during the murders. His claim is that he blacked out during the incident. Naturally, nobody believes him. Moments after he settles into his new cell, 
An earthquake strikes the island. The inmates cry to be let free, fearing that the prison might collapse on top of them. But as they soon find out, that would become the least of their worries. A series of gruesome humanoid creatures begin to indiscriminately kill the inmates and the correctional officers, leaving only Torque and a handful of others left alive. During the ensuing chaos, one of the monsters either deliberately or inadvertently opens Torque's cell. This begins Torque's journey of not only self-preservation, but also trying to figure out the source of the earthquake and the monsters. On the surface, it's a fairly simple narrative, enough to carry the game from one action set piece to the other. Though the subsequent characters and storylines do have a great deal of depth, much of that is relegated to lore items that you find throughout the game. Now I understand why some games might want to render aspects of the story to the background, in order to maintain the flow of the game. Hell, I'll say something even more unpopular. I think sometimes that's the right decision. Having said that though, I believe there should be enough in the main narrative that prompts the gamer to further immerse themselves in that supplementary material. While I'm sure there are a good amount of people that did this with this game, including yours truly, I can easily see somebody playing The Suffering purely as a mindless action game. The frantic gameplay and the macabre setting are so dense that they will distract from the game's deeper themes. In other words, it's easier to contemplate the meaning of something in a slower, quieter game like Silent Hill than it is in a game like The Suffering. However, if you do look into the game's lore, you will find elements that rank The Suffering among the all-time greats. Obviously, the best example of this is the game's monsters. Other reviewers of The Suffering have said this, and I will echo their sentiments. The creature design in this game is on the same level as Silent Hill. Period. All of them not only look cool as hell, but they all bear a requisite amount of symbolism. Just like Silent Hill's monsters, these monsters are all objective manifestations of psychic phenomena. One major difference though, in Silent Hill, the appearance of a monster relates back to a single person, giving physical form to their psychic trauma. While almost all of the monsters in The Suffering are the product of Carnate Island's violent history, of all the minds that died there and the negative energy they left behind. For instance, there was a monster type known as the Marksman. During World War II, Carnate Island served as a prisoner of war camp for the Americans. Many of the POWs were executed by firing squad, a fact that is represented in the Marksman's physiology and abilities. This isn't made obvious unless you read the lore though, and even if you do, there are things that aren't made clear. Let's take the most ubiquitous enemy type as an example. The Slayer. The blades on its arms and legs supposedly represent decapitation. But who was losing their heads? Was it the soldiers during World War II? Was it before then, when the prison was an asylum for the mentally ill? Or maybe it goes back to the 1600s, when some of those living on the island were accused of witchcraft. Were witches getting their heads lopped off? Several incidents throughout the game provoke these questions that don't have any answers. But they stand alongside questions that do get answered. And if you pay close attention, the answers you receive and the ones that you don't will guide you to the ultimate conclusion, the explanation behind all these supernatural events. I will provide that explanation a little later on, but for now, I will quickly review some of the game's other standout elements. One innovative mechanic that the game introduces is a morality system. I say innovative despite the fact that many games, before and after The Suffering's release, had a morality system that affects a story's outcome. There are a vast number of games with a vast number of endings that are attained based on your moral action. Comparatively, The Suffering only has three endings. The good ending, the bad ending, and the neutral ending. Where The Suffering's morality system does stand out is in its immersion. To explain what I mean by that, I will give you two examples. There will be times where it is obvious that you have to make a moral decision. The simplest example comes early on, when Torque is given the choice to protect or kill a correctional officer. 
During this initial encounter, Tork hears two inner voices speak to him. One is the voice of his dead wife, pleading to Tork's better nature, and the other is more demonic, coaxing Tork's murderousness. Understandably, people will criticize this example of the morality system as simple, and the voice acting of the demonic voice as cringe-inducing, myself included. But this is one of a few outliers. The majority of the moral decisions are not obvious, and require the gamer to pay close attention. In my first playthrough, I messed up my opportunity to get the good ending when I came across a padded room inside Carnate Soul Asylum. In there was a CO who had his limbs cut off while he was still alive. For whatever reason, it didn't occur to me that I might need to mercy kill this guy in order to get the good ending. Like with so many other action games, I saw this poor SOB as just a mere digital avatar, whose life or death was irrelevant provided he didn't stand in my way. This moment, amongst many others like it, increasingly immersed the player, making them struggle with the game's temptations to spray and pray and not think about what they're doing. In this way, it's kind of a precursor to beloved games like Spec Ops The Line, which also makes you reflect on your violent actions. Unlike Spec Ops, though, the suffering doesn't do as good a job of making you cognizant of what you did or didn't do towards the end. I only became aware of certain moral choices after I completed the game and started researching guides on how to achieve the different endings. That said, if you read up on the game's morality system, you will become conscious of the various moments where you should have acted ethically, but didn't. When this happens, you will ask yourself what those unethical decisions might say about you. And for some of you, that question might be too horrifying to think about. Moving on to the combat. It doesn't have the same precision or elicit the same feelings of sick joy like the aforementioned Max Payne or most modern third-person shooters. For the most part, all you have to do is aim in the general direction of your enemies and mash the shoot button. Having played a lot of shooters, going back to something so simple and occasionally clunky was a bit frustrating at first. But after about 30 minutes, you begin to not only accept it, but understand why the combat was designed this way. The whole point is to easily and mindlessly spill as much blood as possible, so that you not only get sucked into the chaos, but also risk making those immoral decisions. Granted, you could not use that same excuse in the modern day. For a game released in 2004, though, I'm much more inclined to forgive. Ultimately, the combat succeeds in making you feel the chaos, which makes me more inclined to forgive some of its lesser components. One other thing I need to mention before I return to the story is the game's sound design. The music is fantastic. Shunning the use of most conventional instruments, this game makes use of industrial and mechanical sounds to form its beats and melodies. The sound of pipes and knives clanging and sliding against each other convey a sense of chaotic, terrifying unease, with the rhythms they produce only giving a slight sense of order. The paradoxical feelings these sounds elicit mirror the feelings of not only Torque, but the gamer both of whom are trying to find some sense of sanity and peace within this hell. While few of the tracks are memorable, each one is well-crafted and appropriate for each new setting. However, other elements of the game's sound design bear mixed results. Almost all of the voice acting in this game is really hokey. Now, hokey can be good or bad. Take David Lynch's movies, for example. Sometimes the acting in his movies is purposefully hokey in order to provoke feelings of discomfort. But is it purposefully hokey in the case of the suffering? It could go either way. Whatever the case may be, the voice acting sometimes provokes feelings of unease. But other times it made me want to laugh and ridicule the sound designer. It never consistently provokes feelings of unease, like the hokey voice acting in the Silent Hill games. Thankfully, these bad moments aren't so prevalent that they detract from my overall enjoyment of the game. But there is the sense that if it was done right initially, the suffering could have dramatically boosted its quality. To survive this place, you gotta become it. I, I tried to fight it, but it's no use. 
Of all the positive homages that The Suffering makes to Silent Hill's style, I've yet to mention the greatest one, and that is the central mystery behind both franchises. What is the origin of all these seemingly supernatural events? I believe there is an answer to that question, and I think the best way to present that answer is by looking at one of the primary sources of inspiration behind both games. You know, it's interesting that some Silent Hill fans view its brand of horror as exclusively Eastern, when so much of the world-bending mythology is based around the precedent set by a Western horror film, that being The Shining. The citing of this film as a source of inspiration for both games works in favor of my original argument, that the dichotomy of Eastern and Western horror is not as rigid as some might think. But returning to the original point, how does The Shining explain the mysterious happenings in both games? It seems to me that Carnate Island and the town of Silent Hill share a great deal of similarity with the Overlook Hotel in that movie. A great deal of murder happened in these three locations. In the world of The Shining, it is said that when people died in or around where the Overlook Hotel stands, a piece of them remained. That piece, I argue, is a remnant of psychic energy, a piece of their mind that haunts the hotel, looking for justice. Now depending on how much negative psychic energy a place accumulates, the more real it becomes. In the case of the Overlook Hotel and the town of Silent Hill, both locations only have enough psychic energy to affect certain people, people that have psychic sensitivities. This in turn generates the central mystery of both movie and game, regarding whether or not what we see is actually happening or not. Is there a spirit world that is trying to cross over into our world, or are people just hallucinating? By the way, if you want the answer to these questions, you can watch my videos on The Shining and Silent Hill, which I will link in the description box. In the case of The Suffering, Carnate Island is unique in that so much injustice and murder happened there that a gargantuan psychic bubble was produced. When that bubble popped, the result was a complete breakdown between the spirit world and our world. Now, not only would a select few people see what was going on, but everybody can. What can be done to quell the suffering of those who unjustly died on Carnate Island? Most of those who perpetuated the atrocity that took place on that island are long gone. Now, the innocent pay in blood. With this in mind, is there an ultimate point to the suffering other than to survive, even if it's in vain? Actually, yes. Regardless of whether or not Torque or the other survivors are guilty of the worst possible crimes, there is an inner darkness within all of them, one which the island feeds on. To cut off the island's source of power, one must look inward to quell the beast within, to bring it under one's control. Torque, regardless of his ultimate guilt, struggles with this inner darkness. This psychic distress manifests in the form of a creature known as the creature. At times, it will appear as a separate entity, but other times it will transform Torque's physiology. This creature can become useful if Torque can control it. He can use its rage and brute strength to help him survive, but if he's not careful, he can become indistinguishable from the beast. But how can Torque control it? Well, he can do what every psychoanalyst would suggest. He can voluntarily contend with it. One subtle yet brilliant detail that I didn't pick up on during my playthrough has to do with the rage meter. The more Torque kills, the more his rage meter builds up. Once it reaches its peak, Torque can unleash the inner beast. If he fills his rage meter all the way to the top, but doesn't let out the beast, violent images and jump scare inducing noises will pop up on screen until he lets the beast out. The fear and anxiety that these jump scares induce symbolize the inner darkness taking control of not only Torque, but the gamer. If we do not attend to these negative emotions by contending with that inner darkness, the fear and anxiety that darkness provokes will guide our actions, making us do things we would never even imagine. Will you reign in the inner beast, or will you succumb to it and all the madness surrounding you?
The hard part of doing a retrospective like this is that on the one hand, I want people who haven't played this game to try it themselves. On the other hand, I need to balance the number of spoilers I give out so that people don't get turned off playing it. With this video, I only spoiled what I felt was absolutely necessary. I, along with those who have played the game, will tell you that there is still so much more to experience. Especially the endings, which will reveal how well you fared in quelling the darkness within and without. If you own a PC, you can buy the game on GOG. If you own a copy but your old systems don't work, you can emulate. Both options work very well. I will put links to the PC version and a tutorial for emulation in the description box below. Special thanks to Corbin, once again, for recommending me an excellent game. Make sure to hit the like button if the suffering piqued your interest. Doing so really helps me out. Make sure to subscribe for more Spooktober content, including an upcoming retrospective on another, um, fear-inducing game. Finally, if you like this video, I guarantee you will like either of the two videos you see on screen now. Until next time, just remember to stay safe and stay yellow.